Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. Before I begin today's episode, I feel I should start off with a large apology. I am very aware that the podcast has not been updated for around two months now, and though I've tried my best to stay on top of the newsletter, even that slagged behind a little bit. The main reason for this is because I became ill at the end of November and stayed ill for all of December, and finally started to recover at the beginning of January. It's nothing serious, and it wasn't the dreaded C word. Everything will reveal itself at a later date, but for now, I am better, and I'm going to try and get back on track with at least an episode every two weeks, as I had been doing previously. And hopefully I'll also be able to do some extra bonus episodes in between, because I feel bad and I really want to make it up to you guys. I actually got really stressed at where I had to take a break because we were on part three of three on the series about intellectuals and I was just really annoyed. But now, without further ado, we can finally finish off that series and hopefully swiftly move on to The Great Leap Forward in February. So let's just jump straight into the final episode on intellectuals in the 1950s. So in the last episode, we left off in June of 1957 when intellectuals and students had joined forces to denounce the undemocratic nature of the Chinese government, the interference of the CCP in people's daily lives, and the lack of opportunity for free speech and open discussion. Mao was hoping that by allowing people to voice their opinions freely during the Hundred Flowers movement, the bonds of unity between his fellow countrymen would be strengthened, but instead the opposite happened. While Mao and other officials had tried to take control of the wave of criticism, unfortunately the majority of intellectuals still remained outside the scope of the CCP's direct control, especially those who worked in universities or independently, and had no political affiliation to speak of. In response to this uncontrolled wave of criticism, the party, under the direction of Mao, decided to launch the anti-rightist campaign in June of 1957, in order to rid the country of what they deemed to be threats to the unity of society and the communist cause. There were multiple reasons why the party felt an all-out assault on intellectuals in all fields was necessary, as opposed to just a light reprimanding and forced apologies as we had seen in previous retaliations. The first reason was that a large part of this campaign was aimed at rooting out those who openly opposed Mao's growing cult of personality. This is something that we'll get into more in later episodes, but it was at this time that Mao Zedong thought was quickly becoming the only acceptable mode of thought allowed in Chinese politics, and as we'll see in future episodes, by 1958 there were no alternatives. Secondly, the anti-rightist campaign also has to be seen in the grander context of the total assertion of communist power over mainland China since 1949. Many of the complaints lodged by so-called revisionists during the Hundred Flowers movement revolved around the fact that China's government was filled with communists, particularly the leadership positions, and any semblance of a coalition government had been done away with, and people had less and less space to criticise the government or the party for their missteps and failures. The third major reason was economic. Party officials had realised that there had been a major slowdown in productivity and economic growth, which they decided to blame on deviations from the Maoist line of cooperative work and self-sacrifice for nation-building, as opposed to finding faults in their own economic planning. In fairness, the reason that many places had gone back on collectivization or following central planning guidelines, was because of the very real problems that had emerged in the system. In the countryside, not only was the new system essentially the opposite of the patterns of life and work that peasants had developed over the centuries, but in many places, the results produced from the new methods of farming were actually negative. Unfortunately for the party, some intellectuals had taken it upon themselves to point out the fact that the majority of peasants didn't actually want to join cooperatives, but were being forced to do so. One such man was Fei Xiaotong, who is often known as the father of sociology in China, and had made a name for himself for his pioneering studies of peasant culture in the 1930s and 1940s. In 1957, he published the results of his fieldwork carried out in a village in Jiangsu province, which pointed out that not much had changed since the 1930s, and in fact, Maoist policies had led to many instances of irrational planning, disregard for local industries, failure to raise livestock suited to the environment, and total neglect of children's education. 
The last thing the party needed was people actively undermining their efforts to transform the rural economy, which was so vital as the base for industrialization. Such voices had to, and would be, silenced. The final reason for the launch of the anti-rightist campaign was linked to international communism. Perhaps Mao's reaction would not have been so harsh were it not for other events that had taken place in the socialist world in 1956. In 1956, protests had broken out in both Poland and the Hungarian capital of Budapest. While the Polish protests focused mainly on workers' rights, the Hungarian anti-communist revolt constituted what the CCP regarded as a serious threat to international communism, and they speculated that behind the Hungarian crisis lay a well-coordinated plot directed by the international imperialists, and that, if turmoil were not stopped, a reactionary restoration would occur in Hungary. The incident had a huge impact on Mao's view on both international and domestic policies. With the anti-rightist movement, Mao sought to avoid the same mistakes that the Hungarian leadership had made, by allowing counter-revolutionaries to expose themselves, but instead of just letting them run amok, making sure that they didn't go unpunished. So how was the anti-rightist movement actually launched? Throughout June, the party took the initiative and completely reversed the trend started by the Hundred Flowers movement, turning the tables on the voices of opposition within the intellectual community. On June 9th, 1957, the party made an announcement in the People's Daily newspaper that there would be a counter-criticism to respond to all the criticism that they had been receiving. On June 12th, they announced that, surprise, the whole reason for the Hundred Flowers movement in the first place had been to let the poisonous weeds of society reveal themselves and let all the demons contend among themselves, so that the ordinary people of society would be shocked into uprooting them. However, things had not quite gone as planned. The people's weeding had not been vigorous enough, and so the party had been forced to launch the anti-rightist campaign in order to rectify the situation themselves. The initial phase of the campaign was aimed at non-communist leaders of certain groups, including the other democratic parties and outspoken editors of independent newspapers such as the Guangming Daily, the official paper of the China Democratic League. They were mainly accused of being anti-socialist and anti-CCP, provoking students to rebellion, and trying to sow discord between China and the USSR. It's important to note as well that when I say intellectuals in this context, I'm not just talking about writers anymore. So-called writists in the arts and sciences were also singled out for trying to sway those not quite dedicated to the communist cause to their side. According to Mao, all areas of culture and science were more susceptible to infiltration by bourgeois intellectuals as, quote, to begin with, they are out to gain leadership in the press, education, literature and art, and science and technology. They know that in these fields, the communists are not as strong as they are, which is actually the case. They also know that many college students come from landlord, rich peasant or bourgeois families and believe that these people will rise at their call. Though the party actually brought very little evidence against these supposed traitors, the intellectuals nonetheless routinely confessed to colluding with other intellectuals to form what they called anti-party committees in academic circles and trying to rid universities of all party influence. Compared to other groups, however, the non-communist intellectuals actually got off pretty lightly, usually just being fired from various positions and having to issue public apologies. When contrasted with what writers such as Hu Feng had suffered just a couple of years previously, and what some of China's most famous pro-communist intellectuals were about to go through, this was really just the tip of the iceberg. The reason the hammer fell so much harder on intellectuals within the party was because the anti-rightist campaign was, more than anything, an issue of the state and development of socialist building within China. Those intellectuals who were outside the party didn't really have that much of an effect on the way that Marxism was interpreted by the party, or how socialist policy was formulated by different bodies, or how cultural policies were carried out in official party organs. They usually had no choice but to just do as the party said, so as to secure their own livelihoods. When it comes to prominent communists that we've spoken about, such as Ding Ling, for example, there are a multitude of problems stemming from issues like factionalism, different interpretations of communist ideology, and the brushing up of intellectuals' tendencies to think too much against the party's requirements for unquestioning obedience. To quote the People's Daily, 
The writers inside the party do more harm than those outside. The easiest way to attack a fortress is from within. The fate of those who dared to hold on to their independence streak, therefore, was always doomed to be much more dramatic. Speaking of Dingling, let's take a look at her case, and that of some of the other prominent writers and poets that we've discussed in previous episodes. They were all kind of lumped together in a group, and they were sort of like the main band of revisionists and revolutionary writers. In reality, Dingling seems to have fallen victim to factionalism more than anything else, especially as during the Hundred Flowers movement, when it was at its peak, she didn't actually publish any criticisms of the party at all. Zhou Yang, who we mentioned previously had basically become the head of the literary world over the past five years, saw Dingling as a major rival, especially when it came to younger writers who considered her to be a mentor and a general inspiration. Between 1954 and 1956, Zhou Yang and his gang did everything they could to chip away at Dingling's prestige within the party, linking her to every scandal in the literary world that they could, from the defence of an accused friend, to the encouragement of students and young writers to improve the quality of their work, as well as its propaganda contents. By 1956, Dingling had almost completely withdrawn from the public eye, having neither any high official posts nor publishing much. During the Hundred Flowers movement, pretty much the only thing she said was that writers didn't have to go down to the country or the factory to get materials for their works, and that writers should try to get comfortable discussing the conflicts they saw in society. This was basically an echo of Hu Feng sentiments from 1955, which, if you remember from the previous episode, actually became the accepted party line after Hu Feng had been sent to prison. That still really irritates me. So basically, by the end of 1956, Dingling was towing the party line and keeping her head down. Dingling's main reason for trying to stay out of things was because she'd been caught up in too many rectifications herself and seen too many of her friends go down to buy the party's whole we're open to criticism now we promise line. However, some of her young supporters decided to bring up her mistreatment to top members of the party, bypassing Zhou Yang's followers in official cultural positions and attempting to get the attention of top party leaders who knew her personally. The movement to have Dingling reinstated to her former glory essentially turned into an anti Zhou Yang campaign, with no one rushing to his defence, which was a little bit embarrassing on his part. Unfortunately, this plan ended up backfiring, as Zhou Yang was able to launch a series of meetings aimed specifically at denouncing Dingling and her friend, the editor of the Literary Gazette, Chen Qixia. And when I say a series of meetings, I do mean three and a half months of 25 multi-day meetings with over 200 writers and officials in attendance, which only came to an end because it seemed like they had to and not because Ding Ling actually ended up admitting anything. In fact, she very much did not admit to anything, maintaining the whole time that she'd been nothing but a good party member, that her opposition was to certain people and not to the party itself, and that she only wanted open discussion and less party interference in cultural work, which may not have seemed that controversial to her, but I can understand why the party took that personally. In the end, all of her achievements, accolades, her Stalin Prize for Literature, and support from within and without the party were forgotten. She received probably the harshest treatment of all the accused, being stripped of her party membership, all of her positions in various associations, having her works banned, and being banished to a village somewhere on the outskirts of Heilongjiang province for two years of labour reform. I mentioned that most of the meetings had like 200 people there. It may seem surprising that so many people turned up so consistently to hear and join in the denouncement of their former colleagues, but actually during this particular anti-rightist rectification movement, it was very common for people to show up and actively denounce their former friends. There are two main reasons why intellectuals who were not being accused decided to join in the fun. The first was basically self-preservation, and the second was to move up the ladder of officialdom. Unlike previous purges and rectification campaigns, where if your name wasn't called, you could basically keep your head down and maintain a low profile, The party took individual activity during the anti-writers campaign much more seriously. Silence was unacceptable, and if you were silent, 
that was usually cause for dismissal or a sign that you needed to be sent down to the countryside for labour reform. In terms of moving up the ladder, it turns out that ratting on your colleagues proved to be a great CV booster in the midst of the rectification. A good example of someone who benefited from this process was a man named Yao Wenyuan, a name that means absolutely nothing to you now, but becomes important in the 1960s and 70s during the Cultural Revolution, as he is actually a member of the notorious Gang of Four. Again, might not mean anything to you now, but becomes important later. So he got ahead by vigorously criticising the old left-wing writers and openly aligning himself with Zhou Yang. He ended up securing himself a good position within the cultural bureaucracy, rising through the ranks of Shanghai's propaganda bureau throughout the 1950s. So I mentioned that Ding Ling was sort of bunched together with a few other writers. Some examples are Ai Qing, the poet, and Feng Shui Feng, who, if you remember from the last episode, had actually had his very own personal rectification campaign dedicated to him and who had tried to keep a low profile after having been removed from his position of leadership in Literary Gazette, but obviously he failed at that. So together, about five people were thrown in this group with Ding Ling, and they were used to serve as an example of the revolutionary writers who stood against the regime and were trying to undermine it from within. At first, most of their supporters, especially the students, found it difficult to accept this, But with enough training, these people changed their minds and were happy to go along with the line that Ding Ling, Ai Qing, Feng Shui Feng and the others were all bad people. They were all guilty of thinking that their art form stood above politics, for not wanting Marxism to interfere with their great works of art, and for wanting to write about the truth as opposed to what was really important, class struggle. Like I said, the rectification campaign in this case spread to all areas of society. Similar accusations were levelled against artists, the painting kind of artists, and that's actually what my PhD thesis is about. Basically, everything that was going on in the literary world, the debates about the relevance of socialist realism, the complaints about party interference, and the accusations of resistance to ideological remoulding were all mirrored in the artistic world as well. If anyone wants to read my thesis, which is all about how propaganda art developed during this period, I will happily send you a PDF, but I do not recommend it. So once the dust was settled, how much of an impact did the rectification campaign have on the intellectual world? Well, the results were relatively stark. Estimates of the numbers of intellectuals purged, sent down to the countryside for hard labour, jailed, sent to labour camps and executed varies widely. The most commonly accepted official number is 300,000, but I've also seen ranges between 400 and 700,000, and I've seen numbers as high as 1.3 million, which isn't necessarily outside the realms of possibility. Even those who didn't necessarily receive these official punishments may also just have been humiliated or have had their careers ruined, at least until the post-Mao period, during which many of them were rectified. Apart from writers, academics in general were under fire, and scientists as a whole were denounced for their apparent love of professionalism and attachment to talent, for which they neglected politics. Fei Xiaotong, the pioneering sociologist I mentioned near the beginning of this episode, was forced to give a public confession retracting his statements about the state of China's villages, confessed to doubting the goals of socialism and planning to write propaganda for Westerners against the party. He lost all of his titles and was forbidden from researching, writing and teaching until he was rehabilitated in the post-Mao era. I always love the use of the word rehabilitation in these cases because it makes it seem as if the person has done something wrong and they had to go through a process of improving themselves and getting over what they had done and, you know, moving on from their past when really it was actually the party realising they had made a mistake and allowing somebody to go back to their old position because they had done nothing wrong. But it's always very interesting to me how the CCP manages to skirt around their own wrongdoing. Who says totalitarian states can't be creative? Accusations of being a rightist could do more than cost people their livelihoods. After being dismissed from their jobs, many journalists, for example, were divorced by their spouses and had relations with their families broken, 
Some journalists and editors who had to admit to their mistakes also had to attend ideological remoulding sessions. This was a really big thing. Most intellectuals who weren't sent down for hard labour had to do ideological remoulding. I think these sorts of events also have an impact on the modern day, where we see journalism in China very tightly controlled by the CCP, and even non-state affiliated media is still forced to sort of capitulate to the party line without fail. I think the ultimate results of the campaign were a serious dampening of the individualistic, optimistic spirit that young intellectuals had held as they saw their heroes fall and had to submit themselves to this ideological reconstruction. The writers, intellectuals and cultural workers who were sent off for hard labour or fired from their positions were all replaced by party cadres, putting the party squarely in control of the cultural field. Now, though the party knew that these cadres were lacking in the actual cultural knowledge needed to do their jobs, they had something much better than that, a mastery of Marxist-Leninist ideology. The fact that they couldn't write for Toffee mattered very little, as the priorities of the party had changed from using cultural production to advance socialism to simply advancing socialism, with everything else being dragged squarely behind. The focus of the advancement of socialism enabled what was probably the biggest outcome of the anti-writers campaign, the smooth transition from collectivization to the Great Leap Forward. The programme to increase the pace of rural communization in order to create these vast communes in the countryside was not only supposed to drastically improve agricultural productivity, but also to speed up the adoption of full-blown communism in the people's hearts and minds. Thus, we can probably draw a line connecting all of the events we've spoken about in the last few episodes all the way up to the Cultural Revolution, which began almost a decade later. And in fact, that's actually what most people do. In the first volume of his three-volume series, The Origins of the Cultural Revolution, Roderick McFarquhar, who was a Sinologist and also a British politician, and I didn't know that before, shows that the Hundred Flowers movement, followed by the anti-writers campaign, were the first real blows to Mao, and by extension the party's credibility. These events caused rifts among the upper levels of the party that would re-emerge in later years, and caused Mao to rethink his approach to China's development. Mao's original plan, a la Hundred Flowers, was to win the intellectuals on side by allowing them to air their opinions, their smarts were necessary to China's economic growth after all, but he wasn't actually expecting so many of them to be anti-party, or at least lacklustre about the party. Coupled with economic stagnation that was occurring at the same time, Mao had no choice but to pull back on the whole unity quest and instead launch straight into what the party says goes, so shut up and deal with it. And that's how we end up with the Great Leap Forward, which we'll get into over the next month or so. But the impact of this embarrassment, coupled with the eventual failure of the Great Leap Forward, eventually snowballed into the Cultural Revolution, Mao's grand attempt to restore not only his own prestige, but what he believed to be the correct course of communism in China. So that's what happened during the anti-writers movement, and that kind of concludes the mini-series on writers and intellectuals in the 1950s. Before I wrap up this episode, there is actually something that I want to discuss, and that's basically the question, was the Hundred Flowers movement actually a trap? So there is actually a theory that the anti-writers campaign was part of an elaborate trap set up by Mao and other senior party members to expose and then purge anyone with vaguely anti-party sentiments. So this used to bother me a lot when I was doing my undergraduate degree, and I felt that I was never really given a satisfactory answer for it, you know, from the standard textbook. And I always used to wonder why, after a series of very high-profile purges and rectification campaigns against their colleagues like Hu Feng, why would anyone get involved in the Hundred Flowers campaign anyway, and voice their opinions so vociferously? I mean, could they not see that it was all a trap, an elaborate ruse to catch them out and get them banned from the public sphere and be silenced forever? It really used to bug me. Well, luckily for me and for all of us, it turns out that the answer is just not that straightforward. So as I looked through the academic literature, there are sort of two theories that emerged. The theory of the overt conspiracy, 
and the theory of the covert conspiracy. So, like the names suggest, the overt conspiracy argues that it was an obvious trap, how could you not see that? And the covert conspiracy argues that no, no, it wasn't obvious at all, and in fact, it wasn't even a conspiracy to begin with. So, to be clear, at the time, Mao had tried to argue that both realities were true. So when Mao finally realised that his reputation as a leader and the authority of the party had been put in jeopardy by the Hundred Flowers movement and then by him having to launch the anti-rightist campaign in order to silence the people who had criticised them in the Hundred Flowers movement, he tried to have it both ways. So he would make the argument to non-communists, so sort of publicly, that there had never been a secret plot and the party had always been very clear about the intentions of the Hundred Flowers and that it was always set up to root out the bad elements in society. But in a separate speech that he made to just party members, he said that it had always been a secret plot and his intention was to draw out the poisonous weeds by letting them show their true colours. So really neither of these were true. If it was true that it had always been the intention of the Hundred Flowers movement to expose the bad elements of society, then that would mean that Mao had been lying when he came up with the idea of the Hundred Flowers movement. Because at that time, he announced that the purpose of the campaign was to allow intellectuals to debate amongst themselves so that they could produce better science and cultural work. So which is it, Mao? Did you want to improve intellectual production or did you want to root out the enemies? You can't have it both ways. So I'm firmly team there was no conspiracy, which I think is a real shame because I actually really like the overt and covert conspiracy ideas, but I think they were just retcons by Mao, basically, to try and say that the anti rightist campaign had been the plan all along when realistically that was just not true. In defence of the proponents of the overt conspiracy, by the time the movement had reached some areas, due to the fact that it had taken a long time to sort of trickle down to the countryside, it really had become overt and some intellectuals continued to voice their opinions anyway. So, for example, despite the huge publicity campaign, there were reports of teachers and cadres in rural counties as late as December 1957 through to January 1958 still participating in these airing of their grievances against the party, at which point these villages and townships would have to hold their rectification campaigns in August 1958, once the Great Leap Forward had already started. So even though those intellectuals in rural communities already knew that the consequences of their actions would be purging, they still felt that they could not sit quietly by and let the party's policies run amok in their villages and towns. Which is fair enough. So, in a sense, eventually it was an overt conspiracy, but some intellectuals still just felt too justice-bound to not say anything about the party's policies at all. There is still the question, though, of why did people get involved in the Hundred Flowers campaign in the first place? Even if there was no grand conspiracy, how could people not see that the tide may eventually turn as it had done in previous years? Obviously some people did have this foreshadowing moment. As I said, people like Dingling and the most prominent intellectuals in the party actually managed to keep their heads down a lot during the Hundred Flowers, but ended up being purged anyway. It also seems strange to me that people felt that they could go from criticising some of the party's policies to criticising the party itself and not expect any sort of repercussion from that. So I don't really have a definitive answer for this, but I do have some thoughts as to why it was that people felt safe almost in taking part in such a campaign, especially when it built up momentum and you know people felt a bit safer in numbers and they felt that everyone was speaking up about the party so they could get involved as well. So I spoke in a previous episode, I think it was part one of three of this mini-series. I mentioned that the party had centralised control over the propaganda being produced under their organisations, but not that they necessarily had complete control over all media and culture that was being produced. And this is especially true of the 1950s and possibly the early 1960s, but not so much. 
So my sort of explanation for why people felt safe taking part in the 100 Flowers is that I think nowadays we often see the CCP in all its power and glory, and we have a tendency to project that image backwards throughout history, about 70 years, just sort of assuming that the party has always had a really strong, steady hold over the nation. But if we look at incidences such as the Hundred Flowers, the Great Leap, and later the Cultural Revolution, we can see that that's obviously not the case. Just because the party had the ability to whip everyone up into a fervour, or to drive a campaign, or to win over large groups of the population, that didn't necessarily equate to control. If anything, the regime's power was a bit shaky, especially in the first decade, when the numbers of officials and cadres were actually quite low, and trained propagandists were spread thin, and corruption was afoot left, right and centre. In fact, the party's control over the whole country, including its own internal workers, was so unstable that China is actually still dealing with corruption to this very day. China is massive, and the corresponding huge numbers of party workers, whose positions start from the centre of the state and sort of go all the way down into the village, don't always have aligning ideals and values. If it's impossible for the party to have such a level of control over itself, with all of today's modern technology, then it would definitely be impossible to control those working outside of the state in the 1950s with a handful of semi-trained cadres and a war-battered infrastructure. So, all that is to say that I think a big reason why writers felt pretty secure dissing the party's corrupt officials in 1956, despite the very public takedown of people like Hu Feng, was because they felt that there was a good chance that the party wouldn't really be able to do anything about it. And to be honest, some people did get away with it, relatively speaking. In fact, if there's anything that we've learnt, it's that the people who were closest to the centre, or who had the most prestige within the party ranks, were the most at risk of being punished. The people on the outside, the non-communists, they were fine for the most part. It's also worth mentioning that it's not as if writers lived in constant fear. And that's not to say that the party didn't have the means to take them out, because they absolutely did. But it's worth remembering by this point, a lot of these writers had lived through the May the 4th era, they'd been censored by nationalists, they'd been through the war with Japan. They were basically battle-hardened at this point. Most of them had even been refugees at some point or another. And, ironically enough, those who had been educated under the communist regime were possibly even more likely to speak out against injustice and corruption. They had developed what the party would refer to as a revolutionary spirit, just as they'd been taught. However, all of this revolutionary spirit was to disappear, or at least transform, I guess is a better word, over the next few years, and we will see the reasons why over the next few episodes. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope it was okay, <laughs> considering that it was my first one in a while. Don't forget that Sinobabble has a bi-weekly newsletter on Substack, so you can either go to Substack to subscribe, or you can go to the Sinobabble website at sinobabble.com and subscribe over there. You can donate to support the podcast by going to the website and clicking on the donate button, or you can not do that because you are disappointed with the infrequency of episodes. And like I said, hopefully over the next few weeks I will be producing more content, different content, just interesting stuff to make it up to you guys for being MIA for so long without a reason. So that's it from me and I hope you tune in next time. <laughs>